welcome to Return to Regalia, an Underland Chronicles reread podcast. I'm Una. I'm John. Yeah, today we're covering chapters 14 through 16 of Gregor the Overlander, in which Gregor meets some friendly cockroaches and some not-so-friendly spiders. Where we last left off, Gregor, Boots, and the Underlanders were flying away from the bass land toward the crawlers. After flying for hours, they land in a cave with a ceiling so low, Gregor can't stand up without bumping his hard hat. He notes that this is a good place for the cockroaches to live, because the bats can't fly here and the humans and rats can't fight well. So here he's kind of noticing how smart the crawlers are, yeah. um, which we're going to get a lot of this chapter. A group of crawlers appears, and Boots gets excited about the big bugs again. The roaches are thrilled to meet Boots, and they ask if she's the princess. Boots goes up to one specific crawler and asks for a ride, because she remembers him from the ride through the tunnels to Regalia. Everyone is surprised that she recognizes him, because all the crawlers look pretty much the same. And we learn that this is Temp, the leader cockroach from earlier. This is when Temp officially introduces himself. Temp lets Boots ride around on his back, while Vicus and Solovet go off to meet with the Crawler King, whom we never meet and whose name we never learn. This is this is going back to like what we've talked about of Boots. Well, like I think Boots is also a good candidate for being like the warrior of the prophecy. Like I don't know if she actually is as things play out, but I feel like it's funny how they just assume it's Gregor when Boots is arguably more impactful for the quest than Gregor is, at the, at least for this first quest that they go on. Like, this entire, everything we're going to talk about, it shows how the entire mission would have failed if not for her. Exactly. They also call her out as a chosen one in the next chapter. Yes. So we'll get to that, but like, Boots is a chosen one in her own right, just the same way that Gregor is a chosen one. Gregor is left alone with Henry, Luxa, and Merith, and their bats again. All the bats gather in a clump and fall asleep, which is so cute. And Temp and another cockroach named Tick keep Boots occupied. Just a side note, the name Temp probably comes from the Latin word tempus, which means time, and Tick is like a ticking clock. So they both have like time names, which is very fun. While Luxa and Henry mutter to each other, Merith makes a fire and Gregor asks him if he can tell the crawlers apart like Boots. He says no and reveals it's extraordinary that Boots can. Gregor thinks about how Boots is really good at spot the difference puzzles, and she can always tell whose cup is whose if they get mixed up on the table. So she's kind of got this little superpower. We never get an explanation for why she's the only one who can tell the cockroaches apart. Like, they even mentioned that, like, Vicus is a bit better than, like, most people, but even he would, like, not really be able to do that necessarily. Like, she's better than Vicus at this. Yeah, and she's two. <laughs> Gregor starts checking his spare batteries in the flashlight, but to do this he has to flip the light on and off, which startles Luxa and Henry. <laughs> the narration says... He did it a couple more times on purpose, which was childish, but he liked seeing them flinch. They'd last about five seconds in New York City, he thought. That made him feel a little better. I don't know what to make of this behavior, because this is kind of mean. It is kind of mean. There was also the whole incident with uh, Boots being thrown off the ledge in the, like, the earlier chapters. Right. So they I guess totally he's, deserve it. He's still nursing that wound a little bit. But yeah, this seems kind of vindictive and i don't know like when i read this as a kid i was like oh yeah you get them gregor like right. they deserve it it's it's kind of it's again it's there's there's always this dynamic right with these uh like young adult novels but like, there's like always that bit of antagonism even when they become friends later they're going to like not get along and i like again he's 11 years old yeah uh he's 11 years old he's still like he's like introverted but he's still like confident enough to like stand up for himself he's not gonna just take what they've been dishing out in recent chapters without a fight. Like, he's going to fight back. Yeah. And, um, it is fun. I, I agree. Um, and it's also, like, the other thing is, like, it's not like it's doing them any harm. Right. It's just startling them, because they don't know about electric light. Right, right. They're just not used to it. Yeah. So Gregor finds that two batteries are out of power, and Merith offers to burn them, Gregor grabs his wrist and warns him not to because they might explode. 
He admits internally that he doesn't actually know if that's true, but he remembers his dad saying it was dangerous to put batteries in a fire. And I've read this book countless times and never thought to question this. I always just assumed Gregor was right. So for the first time ever, I actually looked up what happens when you burn a battery. <laughs> Apparently it depends on what kind of battery you have, uh -huh. but in some circumstances, yes, they can indeed explode, and they can release toxic gases. Yeah. So Gregor was right. Yeah. I mean, I'm. that's one of the things I'm doing at my job this summer, is sometimes teaching kids how to, like, spark a fire with flint and steel. Mm. Um, I didn't for sure know that if that Gregor slash Gregor's dad was correct about that. I would say it's a safe bet to just, like, if you don't know how something will react to fire, don't toss it in a flame. Right, exactly. So, I love how Meredith is just so cavalier about doing it, that like he's like, oh, we need to dispose of this, toss it in the fire. Right, because he has no idea. Yeah, they don't have anything that would ex that would react to the flame like that, I guess. Right, yeah, they're so. probably not used to that kind of stuff, just like laying around. Yeah. When Luxa and Henry hear about the potential explosion, they exchange uneasy glances. Gregor adds, you could blind yourself, <laughs> just to be dramatic and freak them out, which I think is hilarious. And the narration says, well, that might happen if they exploded. <laughs> Gregor starts rolling the dead batteries under his sandal to make Luxa and Henry nervous, but stops when he sees Merith is nervous too. So that's nice that he sees Merith and is like, okay, better stop. I will say it is it is fun and ultimately harmless the way he needles them. This is three separate versions of him pulling the same trick on them and right. exploiting their naivete, and trying to scare them. Yeah, with the with the batteries, you got the headlights, you got the flames, you got just rolling around with like like as if it were like an active grenade that could explode in any second. Right, three times in quick procession. And I imagine that they're probably pretty freaked out by this, but. It's not like Gregor's going around tossing their little sisters off pillars. So. Exactly. It's not even like he's tossing the batter. Like, can you imagine if he just, like, chucked one of them towards them? Yeah, yeah. They would cower in fear. <laughs> yeah, he's just got to get his digs in where, where he can, because, mm -hmm. like, this whole place is scary to him, so right. he, he can scare them, like, yeah, a little the bit. the power is definitely still not in his favor at yeah. all. Vicus and Solovet come back looking worried, and they sit down for dinner. Gregor calls Boots over, and she in turn calls Temp and Tick over, which is awkward for the humans because they hadn't considered the crawlers at all. Fortunately, they decline, but Boots orders them to stay where they are, and they sit down. And there's a part when Gregor is telling them they don't have to listen to her, but one of them says, we'll stay here. And the narration says something like, Gregor got the feeling that the bugs wanted him to mind his own business. I didn't write it down, but I do remember that. It's yeah. really funny. I love how Boots just breaks up the entire caste system. I know, right? The the land. That's the beauty about Boots, too, yeah. is that she doesn't know anything, and she's just, like, nice and pure. And um, I think in one of the earliest episodes of the podcast, I talked about how Boots is this symbol of purity and innocence. And this also shows here... She's just not aware of the social hierarchies at play. Um, so she's just, like, taking it all down. She's just ripping it down. During dinner, Solovet and Vicus reveal that the crawlers refused to come on the quest because they don't want to pick sides between the rats and the humans. Luxa assumes they'll eventually side with the rats, and Gregor thinks this would be smart of them because the roaches aren't fighters and the rats would make strong allies. He asks why the crawlers would trust the rats, and Vicus explains they don't think the same way humans do. Henry calls the crawlers stupid and insults the way they speak. And I just want to point out that Henry isn't even attempting to speak the roaches' clicking language, even though he totally could if he wanted to. Right. So if we're judging linguistic skills, I think the crawlers have Henry beat just by virtue of being bilingual. I also love how, like, Gregor breaks down the logic of, like, like what do the hu what are the humans actually offering the roaches? Mm -hmm. Like, at least the rats would offer them more protection, which they have only by, like, defense. They don't have offensive skills, and the rats can provide for them there. Right. And also have... I forget, how. what are the numbers of the rats? Are there more rats than humans, or what's their population? I'm not sure if we have that information. 
I would assume that there are more rats because right. they've been in the Underland longer than the humans have. That's what I would assume too. So again, it would just benefit the roaches more to be with the rats. Right. But like Henry's just, instead of trying to think of, oh, hey, how can we come to a beneficial, a mutually beneficial arrangement here? He's just dismissing them. Exactly. Vicus silences Henry and says, Remember you, when Sandwich arrived in the Underland, the crawlers had been here for countless generations. No doubt they will remain when all thought of warm blood has passed. Henry dismisses this, but Gregor backs Vicus up by explaining how cockroaches have existed as a species much longer than humans have. Gregor gives some numbers here that I tried to fact check. So he says that cockroaches have been around for 350 million years. One source I found said that it's a myth that cockroaches are more than 300 million years old. Another source said 280 million years, and a third said 320 million. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that these sources are working off of when different scientific data was available mm -hmm. or whatever, or like it depends on what you consider a cockroach. That's what I was thinking. It's like maybe there's progenitors of cockroaches that right in existence 300 million years ago yeah by the way still longer than humans yeah. yeah by a mile any prehistoric bug experts in the audience should definitely chime in and let us know what the truth is but according to gregor humans haven't been here more than six million years i'm not really sure where gregor is getting this six million number from that seems wrong too I yeah i say Everything I saw said that humans are only like 300,000 yeah. years old, and I'm wondering if he's thinking of something that came before Homo sapiens, mm -hmm. like some, yeah, just Again, like, like some yeah, ancient... Neanderthals and yeah. Magnon. Humanoids were probably around earlier. Yeah. yeah. So like technically he's right, because we haven't been here six million years, but it seems that we haven't even been here one million, so... Yeah. The numbers are off, but the point stands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder how old bats are. That's a good question. I didn't. They didn't bring that, that up because it's not relevant. But that'd be I'm fun. Curious. Yeah. To look that up. I wouldn't be surprised if they're older than humans. I yeah, I probably wouldn't be. Surprised Most things either. are older than humans. Yeah. Quite honestly. Yeah, we're pretty new. We're, yeah, we're babies. <laughs> anyway, Luxa asks how Gregor knows this, and he tries to explain about fossils and archaeology. He says cockroaches haven't changed much over their millions of years. And though Gregor thinks he's getting on shaky ground here, I did find some stuff confirming this. Mm -hmm. Vicus smiles at Gregor and says, For a creature to survive so long, it is no doubt as smart as it need be. Henry doesn't believe any of this, however, and claims the crawlers are too weak to survive, and that's how nature intended it. Gregor thinks about all the people in his life who would be considered weak because they depend on other people. Like his grandma, who's old, and Boots, who's young, and his friend Larry, who has really bad asthma. So this is where we see the return of this theme about strength and power, and if it always has to come from violence. I really like this paragraph about Grandma, Boots, and Larry. It reminds me of something that I learned about in an anthropology class I took. Maybe you... I know that we have the same professor for anthro, yes, so maybe you yeah. also learned about this. Basically, we have evidence of all of these prehistoric humans who lived to be very old, even though they had disabilities, like they couldn't walk or chew food or whatever. And the thinking is that these people only lived to be so old because there were other humans taking care of them. So the lesson is that humans have always depended on and supported each other. And actually, Henry, that's what makes us strong. Yeah. So... I also love all of this talking about strong versus weak. Gregor never applies it to himself. Because that was a big thing for him, why he's refusing to believe he's a warrior, is because he's not a fighter. But what is true strength? That is such a good point. I think at one point, actually, Vicus does say something like, it might be at the end of this book or a different book, when they're wondering if they should give the sword of sandwich to Gregor mm -hmm. and Vicus says something like he doesn't need a weapon maybe his weapons are something foreign to us right. and that's such a good point that like Gregor's strengths are that he's so loyal and caring and smart and very smart very intelligent wicked smart not all warriors are just fighters they're planners too exactly Gregor asks Luxa what she thinks, and she evades the question. Vicus tells her to think on it as the future ruler of Regalia. 
As everyone gets ready for bed, Boots tries to teach the crawlers to play patty cake, but they get confused. I might try and sneak a quick clip of the audiobook in here because I really want people to hear Boots' singing, and I cannot do it justice the way Paul Bamer does. The roaches waved their front legs in confusion, not understanding what was going on. Pat cake, pat cake, bake a man. Bake me cake fast you can. Pat it, pick it, mark with a B. Put in often for big bug and me. The bugs ask what the song is, and Gregor tells them it's a big honor that Boots put them in it, which I think was nice of him to add. Boots says goodnight to Temp and Tick by saying, Night, big bug, seep tight, and the narration says, Gregor was glad she left out, don't let the bed bugs bite. <laughs> yeah. Let's not have any microaggressions <laughs> towards the underland creatures. It's so funny. <laughs> As they're falling asleep, one of the roaches whispers, honors us the princess honors us which is just so cute they're not used to having humans like treat them like equals i know and right yeah, i again love boots that's the power of boots gregor wakes up hours later and finds boots calmly rocking back and forth holding the flashlight surrounded by hundreds of cockroaches which is just like extremely creepy. It is a very freaky image. Can you imagine like waking up and there's hundreds of cockroaches around? With like, a spooky flashlight yeah. moving around because you know she's not holding that thing still. Yes! The can, shadows are going crazy. I can picture this so well. Like if they made a movie out of this, the lighting would be awesome. It would be so creepy. But that's how the chapter ends. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say like I love this chapter because it's another good Gregor versus Henry confrontation, mm -hmm. but this time Luxa isn't so much on Henry's side. Yes. She's more caught in the middle, not knowing what to think. And this chapter is also kind of like a cockroaches are awesome lesson, because we learn all of these like fun facts about them, and we get to think more about what kind of species they are and where their strengths lie. Any other chapter 14 thoughts? Nothing specific. In general, Suzanne Collins is really good at ending chapters. I know, right? Like, she's very good at having, like, either feeling like it's all wrapped up for this section, or having a cliffhanger that's really effective but doesn't feel gimmicky. Yep. So, in chapter 15, Gregor's first instinct is that the roaches are going to eat boots, so he stands up and smacks his head on the ceiling. Vicus stops him, and Solovet explains that the crawlers are honoring boots. Gregor takes another look at the way the roaches are dancing and realizes they're not just honoring Boots, they're worshipping her. Vicus calls this the ring dance, which is something the crawlers only do for chosen ones in great secrecy. He says the only other human that's ever gotten this treatment was Sandwich. Do we believe this? No. I think it's another idolization of Sandwich that's not owned. There's no way that there's only been one human. This might be propaganda. Yeah. I'm gonna be honest, I don't feel like Sandwich would have treated the roaches as well as Boots had so far. Yeah, I feel like the humans are just making this up, but like, if the roaches hadn't done this for Sandwich, how would we know what the ring dance is? That is a good point. Somebody must have, you know what, I bet it was someone else and they, they retroactively saying it was Sandwich. Yeah, that's true. That could have happened. The roaches stop dancing all at once, and then gradually melt away into the darkness. Boots comes back over to Gregor and says, I see B. Gregor realizes all the other Underlanders are awake, so he just says, she's sleepy, and they all go back to bed. In the morning, Temp and Tick agree to join the quest, and everyone knows it's because of Boots. Mm -hmm. The narration says, Gregor was torn between being very proud and wanting to laugh his head off. It turned out Boots was special weaponry after all. Mm -hmm. Except the crawlers don't want to ride on any bat without Boots, and she has to be with Gregor. So one bat has to take all four of them. Mm -hmm. Poor Ares. Yeah, that job falls <laughs> to Henry's big black bat, Ares. And this is the first time we hear Ares' name. We're literally halfway through the book, and this is the first time we're hearing his name. 
The crawlers are obviously terrified of flying, and Gregor doesn't like it much either. He wishes he could ride on any bat but Ares, because he figures Henry's bat dislikes him as much as Henry does. Ironic, given, given what occurs later in the series. Exactly. When the crawlers get on Ares' back, he flinches but doesn't say anything. Gregor thinks speaking out loud requires a lot of effort for the bats and figures they talk to each other in squeaks too high-pitched for humans to hear. Um, I don't think it's ever confirmed whether or not it's difficult for the bats to speak English, like physically, but it is interesting how little they talk, especially in this first book. Right. Because Aurora hasn't said a single line so far. Vicus says they're headed for the spinner's land and they take off. During the ride, Boots sings nursery rhymes to the crawlers over and over again, and Gregor feels the muscles in Ares' neck get <laughs> tense. <laughs> As they fly over the crawlers' land, Gregor thinks about how the humans and bats have small, densely populated lands that can be protected easily, while the crawlers live across miles and miles. He sees thousands of roaches and realizes that if they were attacked, they could afford to lose more fighters, and with all this space, they could retreat endlessly and make the rats follow them. Mm -hmm. This is also when Gregor thinks about how his mom swats a lot of roaches in their kitchen back home, which isn't an important detail, but it does get mentioned and joked about at several points throughout the series that Gregor's mom swats a lot of cockroaches. Um, so I just thought I would point that out here. Do they ever talk about how like they probably squish a bunch of spiders and trap a lot of rats too? I think there's a point earlier in this book where Gregor talks about how the rats must hate humans because maybe they know what That's humans right. in the overland do to rats. <laughs> um, but I don't think we get anything about spiders. I guess spiders, of the animal creatures, spiders probably have the least, like, continuous presence in the series. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think they only appear in the first and last books. Mm -hmm. Finally, the group lands on the bank of a shallow river. Gregor finds that the ground is soft and spongy, and he sees there are leafy vines underfoot. When he asks how they grow without light, Vicus points out that the river has fire in it, like miniature volcanoes. I'm wondering if where they are right now is like in the jungle or like on the edge of the jungle because that's the only place I can think of as having vines mm -hmm. and also we come back to these like mini volcanoes in the water in the third book when they go to the jungle. Has anyone ever mapped out an official map of the Underland? Because like I know there's no official map. I don't, or I don't believe there's an official map. I know there's I not one in the so. books. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, or I I know people have like made fan art of right. maps before, but I don't think that there's enough information yeah. to make it like accurate. Like we mm -hmm. never get like north or west yeah. directions. Um, it's just the vague regions. Yeah. So like. I've, I definitely am picturing at least someone had made a map. I'll see if I can find it and I'll reblog it on Tumblr. The crawlers procure some fish for them and Merith starts grilling them on the torches. When they sit down to eat, Vicus makes a point of inviting Tick and Temp and shuts down Henry's disapproval by <laughs> saying, It is time those of the prophecy become of one journey, of one purpose, of one mind. All are equal here. Which is pretty damn optimistic of Vicus. Yeah, I mean, I Boots and Gregor will probably be back you on that, but um, yeah, I don't know how much support you're gonna get from the others. Mm -hmm. There's kind of like a recurring theme of Vicus being intensely optimistic about how everyone is gonna get along. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that later. As they finish the meal, all five bats' heads jerk up, and Ares says, "Rats." This is actually his first line, is just rats, exclamation mark. Vicus puts Boots in Gregor's backpack and tells him to run, because the rest of us are expendable, you are not. The underlanders get on their bats, just as six rats enter the scene. The leader rat, who is grey with a diagonal scar across his face, points at Gregor and orders them to kill him. As Gregor runs, he sees Vicus knock the scarred rat into the river. This is, of course, Rip Red, probably the most iconic character in the entire series, but we won't meet him for another few chapters. We'll get there eventually. Yeah. 
Temp and Tick follow Gregor, but he loses them somewhere in the tunnel. When he turns back, he sees roaches filling up the cave, using their bodies as a barricade against the rats. They tell him to run with the princess. Gregor sets a good pace, and after 20 minutes, he runs straight into an enormous spider web. And that's how the chapter ends. But I did want to just say, like, man, 20 minutes with boots on his back? Like, that's really impressive. That's got to be multiple miles he just ran. That's that's some big brother strength right there. He's definitely had to carry boots before. Yeah, but, like... I once ran a 10 minute mile in high school gym class without stopping to walk and I damn near almost threw up. It's, so yeah, I hate running too. I think Gregor must be like the track star of his elementary Honestly, school or something. Also, this is definitely like uneven ground that he's running on. I was thinking that too. Like it's not flat, it's a cave. There's like rocks and shit. Yeah, really impressive, his track skills. I figured, is Boots asleep through all of this also? Is she, or is she I, conscious? I think she's awake, because she was awake for dinner. Mm. But no, she doesn't talk at this point. Yeah, I mean, if she's not scared of getting thrown off cliffside, then she's not scared about any of the goings on right now. The other thing I wanted to point out is the cockroaches like filling up the cave yeah. to block the rats from getting to them. Like, I don't know if I've just skipped over that the past dozen times I've read this book or like what but I've never stopped and actually pictured that and it's absolutely terrifying to think about just like you look back and these gigantic bugs are just like filling up the cave that's terrifying I honestly I think it just sounds cool <laughs> like I'm I'm sure you're saying you think it's terrifying and cool I I'm not a big opponent of bugs generally like I don't like cockroaches but it's like to me it just sounds like kind of awesome like I can imagine like I can imagine what this would look like again in a film setting and I think it would just look super like impressive for sure it would be a hell of a movie scene but like in real life oh yeah just real. like I think bugs that can run fast are so creepy and just like the blown up size of them means that you can see all of their little like bug features it would be so disgusting and like just the idea that they're like sacrificing their lives for them i don't know it's just so intense that's, yeah that's i i wonder in the movie in this hypothetical movie adaptation if they would try to cutify the roaches and the bats and even the rats maybe the rats they probably wouldn't but like i wonder if they like try to soften some of the more realistically yeah. unnerving features. Yeah, no, it would not be cute. Like, in real life, no. these animals would not be cute. <laughs> I definitely, in my head, I remember, like, even now I'm just realizing, when I read about the roaches, because they're portrayed so positively, they're not so much roaches as, like, more like, they feel like kind of like roly-polies in my head. That's more like what they feel like. So, mm -hmm. like, big, like, if they were big, like, it would more be like, oh, they're just kind of, like, armored up. Uh, but no, roaches, uh, now I'm going uh, oh yeah, these are like cockroaches. They're and that's, nasty. uh, that's, that is a little unpleasant to think of. It's so gross. It's gonna be hard to readjust my mind. Like when you see a roach somewhere, I don't, I mean, we don't live in a place that has roaches like New York City, but mm -hmm. like, if you ever see an insect that's just like going really fast across the kitchen floor or whatever, and you're like, oh my god, I can't believe how fast that thing's going, like... Oh, but imagine, like, a giant version. I hate it so much. In one of my courses this past semester, there was a roach crawling around during a class. Mm. And uh, I had to smash it, and it wasn't fun. It was not fun because it was like, you're not going to do anything to me, but I don't like hearing your wings flutter or anything. Yeah, it's just like, I don't know, it activates something in, like, my caveman brain that's just like, you need to kill this pest. Yeah. Anyway... Any other chapter 15 thoughts? It was kind of like an intermission chapter. Yeah, it's a transition from... We, we get at the very beginning, okay, the roaches are joining the mission, but that's me. Mm -hmm. I will also say, I kind of forgot spiders even existed in the series until, like, I mean, until, like, the prophecy got brought up. Like, I forgot that they were presents. Yeah, they really only appear in this first book, and then there's, like, one spider in the last book, and it probably has, like, two lines. Yeah. Like, I I remember, I remember firebugs appearing in this more than the spiders do. Yeah, yeah, in the second book we're gonna get the fireflies. Ugh, what a treat. 
Chapter 16 starts with Gregor ripping his face off the web, and it feels like yanking a strip of tape off his skin, which just sounds terrible. He says, I am Gregor the Overlander. I come in peace. <laughs> and he figures he got that from some old movie. He looks down and there's a huge spider wrapping his feet together with silk, which I would be screaming my head off. I hate spiders. I can't imagine giant spiders. They're just so creepy. And if you just like looked down and there was one right below you, like wrapping up your feet, I would scream. It's the same with like with bugs and with rats. Like I'm not really scared of most of those things. If they're human size, that's a different story entirely. <laughs> Gregor tries to explain that he's the warrior, but the spider just keeps wrapping up him and boots. Finally, he tells the spider that Vicus sent him, and that makes it pause. Gregor shines his light around and finds more spiders, but they all ignore him when he tries to talk to them. Can you imagine just like lifting your flashlight into the dark and there's just like a cave wall covered in spiders? I hate it. I will also say, I love that this is the first time he's ever trying to claim the title of the Great Warrior from the Prophecy, and they just don't care. Yes! Like, yeah. all throughout this time, he's mostly been, like, either denying that he's the warrior or just playing along for the sake of the prophecy so he can see his father. And now he's, he's like, trying to flex that muscle and it's it not It doesn't taking. work, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's trying to play the warrior card, and it's just, like, it means nothing to the spiders. I wonder if the spiders just, like, don't care about the prophecies at all. I have a note later on in this chapter about, like, how well do all of the different animals in the Underland know the prophecies? Because they came from a human, and not all of the animals care as much about the humans as, like, the bats and the rats do. So I wonder, does, like, literally everyone in the Underland know about the prophecies, and, like, how well do they have them memorized? I'll get to it later. We'll come back to that. I also bet, like, I mean, if the spiders don't play an important part in the series, like, on a mental level, I think that probably means not a lot of the prophecies pay a lot of attention to the spiders either. So even if they do know the prophecies, most of it's probably like, oh, well, we're not involved with this, so why does it matter to us? Yeah, I bet that might be it. Like, there's probably just not a lot written about the spiders, so they don't have to learn about the prophecies as much. Gregor yells at the spiders for a while and has Boots sing the Itsy Bitsy Spider at them in case her special bug powers work on them. <laughs> at one point, an insect flies into the web and a spider runs over to drive its fangs into it. The insect gets wrapped in silk, broken into pieces, and then pumped full of spider juice that liquefies its insides, and the spider starts to drink it, and Gregor has to look away. That's how real spiders eat. It's disgusting. <laughs> and it'll happen again in yeah. this book. Is this a normal-sized insect that gets eaten, or is it a giant-sized insect? I was wondering, because it doesn't say what the insect is or how big it is. It's such a- it's, it's a very strange mixture of, like, giant-sized and regular animals in the Underland. Like, earlier they mentioned how, like, they caught a fish, and it's like- it's assumed that's not, like, a fish that's, like, the size of a queen-sized bed or anything. Like, it's just a regular fish, most likely. Yeah, yeah. They but then definitely... how, do the, how do the rats and bats and roaches and spiders get to be so massive? Yeah, we really never get an explanation as to why some of the animals are big and can talk. It's just, like, this is the world we're in. And it's one of those things where, like, I don't care. Like, that's a world, like, there, there's other world building going on that's much more prioritized for the better. Mm -hmm. It's just an interesting thing to note for me. Yeah. It's something I wonder about a lot. Gregor wonders if Vicus and the others will show up, or if something bad happened back on the riverbank. He remembers what Vicus said about him being irreplaceable, and figures it's because they could always get more flyers, crawlers, and spinners, and Nerissa could stand in for Luxa or Henry, but they wouldn't be able to find two overlanders like Gregor and Boots with a dad imprisoned by rats. Although I will say, the one that is lost still doesn't need to apply to Gregor's dad. Exactly. The main thing would be waiting for two more overlanders to fall down and survive. Yeah, that's the only actual requirement, is that it's two overlanders. And they wouldn't even have to, like, come down at the same time. Right. Once another Fred drops down, just imprison him. Yeah, until wait for another, another one. one. Yeah, because the whole, like, 
a son of the sun thing doesn't actually have to reference Gregor's being a son of his dad. Right. It could just mean one thing of like being a son of the son of that he's an overlander. Yeah. So they could probably stretch it to mean anything else yeah. if Gregor and Boots died. <laughs> I mean, this is, you could argue this is already stretching of it. Like, it's, they interpret it however they want to interpret it. Boots asks Gregor if they can go home and see their mom, and Gregor tries to tell her that they have to get their dad first. Boots knows their dad from photos, but has never met him in person because he disappeared before she was born. I think this, when Boots is asking to see their mom, is kind of like the first sign that she's headed toward her meltdown that happens in yeah. a couple chapters. Um, this is 100% the longest she's been separated from her mom. Yeah, and she's been through a lot, and she's in this whole new world, it's dark all the time, and even though she loves the giant animals, it's yeah. like, I am surprised that she has lasted this long without having a meltdown. Yeah, honestly. She's been a trooper. <laughs> yeah, so the tantrum that happens in a couple chapters is totally overdue. The spiders start to hum a melody, and Gregor tries to remember it, so he can play it for his dad on his saxophone later. Um, I don't know what this spider melody is like it doesn't actually come back and they never explain mm -hmm. what it is and i don't know why they're like singing i don't know if it's like to try and calm gregor and boots down like what are they trying to do they do mention that they're very noisy <laughs> yeah yeah maybe they're just trying to get them to shut up maybe it's a before a meal ritual <laughs> yes so gregor thinks about how his dad got him his first saxophone from a pawn shop when he was seven and taught him to play it Gregor begins to wonder what the rats are doing to his dad when Henry appears and calls out to the others. Vicus comes over and politely asks the spiders to free Gregor. Everyone, even Luxa and Henry, help to cut Gregor out of the silk wrappings, and the crawlers chew through the cords around boots. The underlanders and bats have several wounds, but everyone is alive. Merith says, We thought you lost. Gregor thinks he means lost in the tunnels, and Luxa corrects him by saying, not lost in direction, lost forever. And Gregor realizes she means dead. He asks what happened to the rats, and Vicus says they were all killed because he's a damn liar. Because <laughs> Rippert is still yeah. alive, and Vicus like, made a deal with him. I forget if he made that deal like within this time while they were fighting on the river, or he made the plan earlier. When we meet Rip Red, we'll get back to that. I love- it's not even like- like, he knows this is going to come up later on during this quest. Like, this lie is not going to be sustainable. Right. And he still does it. It's just a pathology for him at this point. Yeah, like, if he wanted to, he could right now say, like, oh, we killed all of them except the one who's gonna help us. Like, and like, cause like, he knows one of them's going to join them. Yeah. Like, that's in the prophecy that they've gone line by line through. Yeah, he's like, I arranged a guide for you guys, and he's a rat, and it's in the prophecy, so don't worry. But, this like, is, he's... Yeah. Vicus is so obsessed with, like, controlling what information is given because he thinks that, like... I think that Vicus thinks that he, he gives too much information. It's gonna, like, overwhelm Gregor. We're well past that But point, we're, like, buddy. so past that, Vicus. We're like, in a spider web right now. Give us the whole story. <laughs> Anyway, he tells Gregor it's good that all the rats are dead um, because they saw his face and they would have been able to report back to the other rats how much he resembles his father and thus revealing him to be the son of the sun from the prophecy. Gregor recalls how Shed and Fanger reacted to seeing his face and realizes they also must have thought he was the warrior. This is my question is like, did Shed and Fanger know the whole prophecy well enough to recognize that Gregor looked like his dad and was an overlander and then like make the connection of like, oh, he must be the overlander warrior, a son of the sun. Like, I don't know if the rats would really, I don't know, like Shed and Fanger didn't seem like they'd be the type of rats to sit around and like read up on the prophecies. I guess it doesn't even have to be related to the prophecy for them. Like if they notice, oh, this human who we're attacking looks an awful lot like the one we're imprisoning. Maybe they're related, and maybe this human won't be very happy that we're keeping the related human 
captive and trying to force him to work for us so maybe we should better end this human so that there's no loose ends i think that's more likely but gregor seems to think that they thought that he was the right. warrior i also love that like the rats have much better facial recognition skills than the humans do <laughs> like the humans are like saying like oh we, we can't tell any of these bugs apart and the rats are like, oh yeah, this human looks very similar to this human yeah. on like on site. Like immediately they notice that connection. Yeah, I think they must because they have met the other humans and know that like none of them look like Gregor and his dad. Yeah. I don't know. I really want to know like the prophecies are all written in the prophecy room in the palace for the humans. Mm -hmm. But like, have those been distributed somehow? Like, did they just hear about the prophecies by word of mouth? Or, like, do the rats also have the prophecies, like, carved somewhere for them? And if so, did a human do that for them? They wouldn't have done it themselves. I don't think they could have. I will say, similar to the idea of, like, oh, there must have been some humans who didn't believe in Sandwich's prophecies, I bet there were also some humans who were like, oh, I believe in them. But I also think that the humans are awful and I want to go defect to the other species. Mm. And so maybe that's how they got spread. Or maybe the rats just don't know the full story. They just know, like, some new, uh, some vague details about the prophecies. Yeah. Like, even, or even some of them. They know to be on the lookout for an overland warrior, but they don't actually know the full prophecy. Right. And I mean, I forget, do they know about the prophecy of Bane? They do, right? Yes. Yes. So, like, they definitely know some of them, especially, again, I think it's probably the ones that pertain to them. That makes sense. They've heard about. Yeah, the ones that are about the rats, they yeah. know about. Yeah, I mean, Rip Red definitely knows all right. of them. I just can't imagine that, like, every creature in the Underland has these prophecies memorized. Yeah. I mean, again, like, kind of what we got with the roaches, like, when they're calling Boots the Chosen One, like, they kind of have their own system of belief set. Yeah. And, like, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe even if the rats do have, like, an idea of what the prophecies are supposed to be, like, they have their own interpretations of them and their own, like, goals of how to utilize those prophecies that will benefit them. Yeah, for sure. So one magnificent spider with striped legs comes over to Vicus, and he greets her as Queen Weevox, which I think is an awesome name for a spider queen. She rubs her front legs over her chest, and an eerie voice comes out, though her mouth doesn't move. Yeah, yeah so this is, we learn how the spiders talk by making vibrations on their bodies with their legs. Gregor compares Weevox's voice to how his neighbor with a hole in his neck from an operation sounds. Vicus introduces Gregor, and Weevox complains about how much noise he was making. When Vicus goes on to explain the quest to her in a soft voice, Gregor realizes the best way to talk to the spiders is quickly and quietly, and that yelling had been counterproductive. <laughs> After hearing the story, Weevox says... As it is Vicus, we will not drink. Web them. And a horde of spiders starts building a 30-foot-tall funnel of silk around the group. Gregor asks what's going on, and Solovet tells him they are the spiders' prisoners now. I just love how when they start getting engulfed in this funnel of silk, everyone's kind of like, well, Vicus, you tried your best, man. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. He, again, getting back to, like, is it optimism? Or is it foolishness? He's really towing that line. He really treads that line. <laughs> and like, I know it's next chapter that we get more into like, oh, why he even gave this a, ch a chance the way he did. But it's like, come on, man. I know we were in a rush, but you could have planned this out a bit better. Yeah, he says something about like, well, I thought with the recent trade agreements. <laughs> yeah. He's just really, he really wants everyone to work together and, like, bless Vicus, I love him, but he is not proven to be the most realistic person in the series. Also, it's just hilarious that, like, Vicus, who is so much about everyone getting along and, like, being peaceful, is married to Solovet, who is yeah. the leader of the army, and she's, like, later revealed to be so brutal. <laughs> we'll get to that when we get to it, but... yeah. It was an exciting few chapters we covered. There's a lot. A lot there. We learned about the cockroaches. We learned about the spiders. We got a little bit more of Henry and Luke's up, but not too much. 
Ares is introduced. Ares got introduced. That's big. Even though he has only said one line. Yeah. We get a hint at the greatest character in the series. <laughs> yes, yes. Technically, Rip Red appears, but is not yet introduced. We'll get back to him soon, though. We're working towards the meltdown. I had forgotten uh, that the meltdown was yes. like a, as big as it was. Which also proves to be special weaponry later. Yes. I can't wait to cover these next couple chapters when they escape out of the spider's imprisonment. It's a great, great scene. But for now, uh, thanks so much for joining me, John. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Next week, we'll be covering chapters 17 and 18. You can follow us on Instagram and Tumblr at Return to Regalia. And until next time, fly you high. Mm-hmm.